So I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. It is 4.05, and I want to welcome you to the study session in the Mesa Public Schools Governing Board. On March 30th, 2020, Governor Doug Ducey announced that Arizona schools would be closed for the rest of the year due to the COVID-19 health crisis. In early April, when his stay-at-home order was issued, governmental functions, including school board governing board meetings, were exempted from the order. So while it is legal to have an in-person school district governing board meeting, our district is choosing to exercise safe social distancing for our meetings by using a virtual meeting platform. The following will be the rules we are using for our meetings. Although members of the board are not gathered in a central physical location, we do have a quorum in attendance. This meeting by video conference and we are awaiting two more board members that should be here shortly. Um, we are meeting by use of WebEx conferencing platform and live streaming through YouTube, which allows for members of the public to view and or listen to this meeting. You can access the live stream at mpsaz.org slash live. That is mpsaz.org slash live. If you need accommodations, please contact Martha Head, assistant to the superintendent and governing board. Her number is 480-472-0201. All other meeting procedures will adhere to board adopted procedures to the extent practicable. All other, uh, excuse me, a recording from this meeting will be available to the public via our district's board docs online software within three business days of the meeting. We apologize in advance for any unforeseeable difficulties and ask for your patience as we navigate unprecedented conditions. Okay, and with that, we are going to jump right into the first item. Um, C, discussion of superintendent's goals and transition plan. And I'm assuming that's you, Dr. Forless, that will take away, uh, take the reins on this one. That sounds great. Thank you, uh, President Minor, members of the board. Uh, we had a great opportunity on June 2nd uh, to come together and start to discuss what my goals will look like for the 2020-21 school year. Uh, and based on feedback and really a rich discussion uh, on June 2nd, I have taken your feedback and revised those goals and then aligned that to the transition plan um, that you have linked within our docs today. So if you would like to take a look at the, per the proposed performance goals, for 2020-21. Got it. You have them. Yes, you have them. It, would anybody like for me to share my screen? Would that be helpful or does everybody have a copy? I, I have a copy, Andy. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Board Member Richardson, are you, would you like uh, me to share the screen? We lost her at one point. I hope we didn't lose her again. She said she had to restart her computer, but she said she was back on. It looks like she's back on. I, I'm i back on twice different times, so yes. Oh, good, good. Okay, excellent. Uh, so I'm just gonna call your attention um, to the overall, the three goals that I have before you. And that first one is to develop um, strong relationship and two-way communication with stakeholders. Uh, I had originally written into that goal to build a, the strong relationship with the governing board, and we brought in that to say all stakeholders. So you'll see that the um, items underneath include uh, the work that we are going to continue to do to build communication protocols that will be done in an upcoming uh, retreat. We did not, we were not able to finish that on June 2nd. Um, talking to what the status report, informing and advising the board, um, quarterly reflection and check-in to monitor progress towards uh, my goals and then the uh, end of the year evaluation. What I also added was that staff and community um, section and uh, that was based on feedback from June 2nd. So if you wanna, if you've had some time to review that, we can answer questions in just a bit. And then moving on to uh, the plan to open the 2020-21 school year during a global pandemic. Wow. That is a lofty goal. Um, I want to make each and every one of you very, very, very proud. So um, I am taking this very seriously. Um, and I'm gonna tell you, this is a team effort, a team of collective IQ that I'm so proud of 
that has been able to um, help in this work. We have identified five commitments as we open up school, and you will see that those are the same that I had shared with you on June 2nd. Um, prioritizing the safety and wellness of our students, our employees, and our community, and then successfully transitioning uh, into the new year by um, offering choices to our community, instilling confidence in our uh, families by providing safe learning environments, and then confidence in our employees about providing safe working environments. And lastly, per personalized, personalizing learning uh, for every student to deliver upon our uh, basic public school promise. Uh, we have spent hours upon hours upon hours and collective hours working on this as a team. And um, this is top of mind. Uh, we begin just about every uh, meeting saying, this is the most important work that we are doing right now. And so we are making some strategic decisions to put some other things on hold so that we can make this our top priority. Um, within that opening of the school year plan, uh, part of the goal is to design collaborative processes, multiple processes to develop and monitor uh, the plan as we open up school. We've got a task force made up of 11 design team, teams that you're gonna hear more about today as we go through a focus group with you as our governing board to give us feedback. Uh, we are serving our staff, our parents, and our students in multiple ways. Uh, so that is front of mind. And then timely and relevant communication to staff, parents, and community. And that includes a robust uh, marketing plan that we spoke about. And uh, Mr. Peterson weighed in talking about the importance of not losing our market share because of the decisions that we're making. So um, we are very mindful of that, and we are constantly um, weighing the, the balance between um, choice and safety and what is right for our community. So that is uh, front and center in our decision making. And then the last goal is implement, in implementation of the strategic plan. Uh, we kicked off our leadership academy. Uh, Dr. Lester is going to talk about that today in his superintendent updates, focusing on the portrait of the Mesa Public School graduate and its impact on equity and um, learning. That means that we are going to focus on two of the five goals within our strategic plan, and that is ensure equity and ignite a culture of learning and well-being. We believe those are most tightly aligned to the work of opening up school and the data that we are hearing about both um, concrete data as well as anecdotal stories and data from our, our principals saying this is our highest priority. We must pay attention to the social and emotional well-being of our students and our staff. Um, throughout our next school year. We have a team um, that will, has, is working on developing key performance indicators for the equity goal, but then my stretch goal is to, to expand that to all five of our goals by the end of the school year. And then a communication and implementation plan for the strategic plan um, will come before you before the end of the year. So th those are those three goals. And then on the back, you will see the transition plan that incorporates those and puts those into a timeline. So I would like to open up any questions that you may have, um, comments, wonderings. I'm happy to uh, tackle those with you this afternoon. One of mine is really easy. I noticed under the strong two-way communication with stakeholders, some of those circles were filled in and some were not, does that, I didn't know what that indicated on my, I didn't know oh. that. Did, did that mean we still needed to talk about some or we talk some? Um, no, that is your strong attention to detail on my formatting challenges. Um, so when I, when I hit return and back and some are filled in and some are not, I didn't even notice until right now. So. No, okay, good. No I reason. didn't know it meant like we were, you know, when we agreed on them, we were dotting them in or something. Thank you. That's perfect. I wish I would have been that smart to do that, but um, no. <laughs> so no, there's no significance to the filled coloring within the lines or keeping them open. <laughs> I will. I will open. I will make sure they're all open circles. <laughs> Dr. Forless, I, I thought you did a great job summarizing what we talked about in the last study session. I could not find 
anything to pick on you about. I was trying <laughs> because I wanted to be smart and and look like I really knew what I was doing here, but um, but I could not find anything that you missed. And I thought you did a great job of summarizing. I, I really don't, I think it's pretty good. And maybe I'm missing something, but I, I thought it included everything we talked about. And the other things that we are going to continue to talk about would be at another study session that we felt did not need to be as a big goal for you, but could be as something else we talk about as an administrative goal. So I'm, I'm really comfortable with it. Excellent. Dr. Forless, um, I am, I am too. I'm, I'm, I'm real comfortable. I'm really glad the way that you were able to concisely put together um, the various um, um, ideas from the board in, in your framework and, and something that you're comfortable with. Um, one of the things that I'm noticing is, is that in one, two, and three is the importance of communication. Um, um, it, it's very clear to me that you understand that communication is, is the key to how you're going to be able to achieve these goals. And there's, there's one thing that I would like you to possibly take a look at. It's old technology, it's old school. But, but if we're thinking about equity, not all of our citizenry um, our community, nor our, our, our parents um, have um, devices. Now, I know the kids will have devices. Now, whether parents can operate those devices are, is a whole different thing. And we, and we found out in this past spring that not everybody knows how to work the devices. And, and, I, and I love that, you know, we're gonna have relevant communication, consistent, timely, relevant communication in multiple formats. But I'm thinking we need to have one central area where a person can click something on and see what the district is saying instantaneously. And so we had a thing called EdTV. Mm -hmm. If I would like you to investigate resurrecting EdTV, because we have had people who are used to attend our board meetings in person who cannot do it online. We have, we have, and, and, and Pete and I know this from having been back East and, and, and being teachers and students, there was one radio station you turned on to find out if school was closed, you know? And, and it was one place, we didn't have to go multiple places, there was one place. And I'm thinking, even though we wanna operate in multiple formats for people to, to, to get to them, one place where everybody could automatically turn on one switch might be the ticket. It also could be the means of marketing the district. It also could be a way of training, not only our employees and our students, but our community and parents as well. It could be, it could open up, I think, a window, a screen, if you will, um, to everyone in our community. So um, ju that's just a suggestion because I want, I want to, I really want you to be very successful in your first year. Thank you. Thank you. That, 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 that is an interesting idea. I believe it was called channel 99. Right. That, and, and we actually have a city council person, Mr. David Luna, who used to run that television station. And he has offered his services to you. If you would like to contact him Excellent. about what needs to be done. And I know that Mrs. Hollins has also investigated it, but uh, it's just something I think that that might not be a bad idea to just at least take a look at and see if you're comfortable with it. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. That's a good suggestion. I have a lot to learn about Channel 99, so this will be good. <clears throat> And once again, that's just a, uh, once again, we get into giving you suggestions, but not how to, how to execute it, but uh, that was an idea. Uh, my only input on the, on the plan would be, <clears throat> we talked fairly extensively when we went through it uh, about special education and I see special education. I do a, a search and find in the document under uh, implementation of strategic plan under ensure equity and uh, just encourage you then to figure out how we can uh, address that one effectively to deal with the challenges we have there. 
I, I appreciate that. That uh, we have a plethora of data that we need to bring together to tell the whole story. And I think that that's why it was important for me to include in here to analyze our systems. Um, I think that uh, we have many data points that can lead us down a better to give us some guidance around some decision making that needs to be done. So um, that is definitely the the first step is to take a look at all of this different data to say how do we get to a place that is um, meeting the needs of our children and, and their families. I that was important to me, and I was really glad to see special education uh, science, you know, uh, highlighted in the in your first three goals. But I also I think it's fair for our board that we will need to quickly decide. Um, I don't think we formalized what tool will you use for your evaluation, so that as you are doing these things, you know exactly how we're going to look at what you're doing, and and we'll try to do our part to have that to you quickly, so that you can. Uh, so that you can know how to best communicate what's happening in your progress. I love that you have quarterly we'll talk and and become comfortable with um, where you are or what progress you're making so that there is some ability to shift and reevaluate as we go. Um, you know, who, who knows, as, as hopefully we well <laughs> over the year and the pandemic yes. pales in, in importance, then we can um, Dive deeper into the strategic plan implementation and and that will be and so I love that there's that ability to adjust in our in your timeline. Uh, yeah, I think that that's very important as I think about um, what we learn every day is shaping the next day, the next month. We don't have you know years of history around how to open up schools during a pandemic, so. I, what, what we keep saying is this is our most important work and we're making those strategic decisions of some of the things we're going to put on the back burner. And so um, I appreciate that flexibility so I can talk to you about some of those things we're putting on the, the back burner to make space for um, people to, to work so hard to get this right around opening school. So thank you. Um, Mrs. Richardson, I will also add to that because I think it is too also. Um, valuable that we have a tool that she can be measured by and she knows what she's being measured by. And I know Marcy, you can appreciate that too, because you mentioned that back a year ago or two years ago, almost now, when you started on the board. And um, I, I started to show a template of an idea because of course I'm only one board member, but I, I, I've gotten one from another school district, a very large school district that I'm uh, allowing Andy, Dr. Forless to adapt to our district. And then we will have a study session with the board where we will review what we think is an adequate and a, um, a tool that we feel comfortable with and that Dr. Forless feels comfortable with. So everybody will be able to weigh in on that tool and add to it and, um, and we'll have something that she can actually look to as she progresses through this these goals and the first year here so i just wanted to reassure the board we're working on that and we'll all get to weigh in and and if you don't like any of it we can start from scratch <laughs> but we, we're at least starting with something to get going on are there any other comments or questions to dr forless before we move on to the next item we will be voting on this in the next meeting. So I noticed that uh, Mrs. Sears is not here. I don't believe I haven't seen her come in. We'll definitely give her an opportunity between now and the next board meeting to weigh in on any uh, comments or questions to these goals. And hopefully next meeting we'll be able to vote on it and approve them so they will be official. Okay. Thank you, President Miner. Thank you. Okay, well, then with that, we will move on to the big discussion of opening school focus group. And again, I believe we're turning that over to Dr. Forless. Well, this is a uh, definitely uh, a proud moment to be able to turn actually over to uh, Mrs. Williams. Uh, we have been working as a superintendency team and then an extended uh, leadership team. Uh, working on an opening school task force. And this is an opportunity for you this evening to participate in a focus group to give you where you have an opportunity to share your thoughts 
about um, our initial plans that we bring to you. And as Mrs. Williams starts into the presentation, she's going to emphasize the word draft and flexibility and safety and choice. So those are the words that we hope that you hear time and time again, because it is our goal that we are building um, up comfortability and confidence in our plan as we open up school. So I'm gonna hand this over to uh, Mrs. Williams and she is gonna walk you through um, a focus group for you to weigh in and share your, your questions and your wondering. All you, Holly. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Forlis. Good evening, everybody. I'm so happy to take you through the experience that we're giving our stakeholders right now. And so you're gonna see, um, some of you may have already attended, but you're, this will be familiar information to you, but we're gonna try and mirror it as much as possible as the experience our community has had for two opportunities so far and one more tomorrow morning. We're having great response. And in the main meeting tonight, I will share with you some of the numbers of people who are attending and some of the data from the meetings that we've gathered so far. But I wanted you to, to know that uh, as Dr. Forla shared, this is our draft and we're sharing that with the community in this way because we want feedback. We're looking for an opportunity for our community to tell us what they think about our draft. It doesn't answer all of their questions. If it answered all of their questions, we wouldn't need their feedback. <laughs> we would only be looking for them to just say thumbs up or thumbs down, right? So feedback means that we grow together and we collaborate truly on the work that's being done. So when I, when I hear people tell me, well, it didn't answer this, this, and this for me, I think that's fantastic feedback because now we know in the, in the uh, final draft of the plan, those questions need to be answered so that they feel like this plan really is robust enough to support what they need either as a parent, as a community member, as a teacher, or as a student. So, and I'll share some of my um, insight about the groups that I've led and the conversations that we've had over the past week with the st stakeholders. It's been, it's been very, very rewarding. So, Cody, if you'll take us to the next slide, we're gonna modify our practice a little bit tonight. Usually this is where we ask the parents or stakeholders um, to do a little practice poll. And I'll just tell you, with only five of you uh, as part of our session, we didn't load poll questions for you tonight. What we're gonna do is we'll pause at different times of the presentation and we'll just talk about it. So I'll ask you some of the poll questions that we asked our administrators today, because they're a little different than what we asked the parents. Um, and then we'll we'll have a conversation. So um, uh, you won't have to lean forward on your computers and hit uh, which one you like. We won't ask you your favorite ice cream flavor, but we will be stopping periodically throughout the, the presentation to get your feedback, okay? So Cody, we're gonna move on to the next one. So you've seen this slide because I've shared this with you as we started our design team work, but I wanna review it again. Our design team began our work crafting this plan by making some commitments. And our commitments were around safety, choice, and instilling confidence in both our stakeholders and our employees that we are providing a safe environment for them. And as always, we continue to emphasize our promise that through personalized learning, we, we achieve our promise on knowing every student by name, serving them by strength and need, and ensuring they graduate for, ready for college, career, and community. So our guiding factors of safety and choice are clear in these commitments. We know there's much that we do not know yet, but we know that the stakeholders of Mesa expect us to make plans with safety precautions in place and plans that allow for choice. We know that Mesa Public Schools is the best place to learn and work, and we want all to find an option to meet their needs. Next. One of the things that we've learned during the pandemic Cody, will you advance the slide, please? Is that there are many unknowns. As we develop this plan, we use CDC guidelines and the Arizona Department of Education guidelines. We also tapped into our educational partners to share best practices. We know that this is an ever-changing situation and our plan may change before the first day of school. Changes day to day sometimes. But we believe that through consistent communication with the community and our leadership team, we'll be prepared for whatever changes may be needed, and we will communicate those with, with our stakeholders as we know them. This plan is based on what we know right now today in June. As circumstances change, 
We will adapt as needed. With cases increasing in Arizona, the mayor of Mesa has issued a procl proclamation making face coverings required in Mesa. And Maricopa County has also issued a face covering requirement. We will follow these guidelines and work on accommodations for specific student and staff needs as they arise. Okay, next. Our first steps in our planning was to reflect on the lessons we learned during unexpected closure this spring. We asked ourselves, what were the major, top, major topics of consideration as we closed out the school year? And 11 topics were clearly our top considerations. As we look at opening of school, we felt that it was important to create a design team for each of these topics. We had 11 design teams with over 170 members that included teachers, leaders, staff talking to us about what it would look like when we open through the lens of these 11 topics. So I can just share with you from my experience, I, I was co-leader of sports specials and extracurricular team with Steve Hogan. And we, you know, we had to prioritize our work because not only were we planning for the opening of school, but we were also talking about what kind of summer activities we allow for our students in a safe manner. And so our, our team um, did a little work um, right away on can we offer some sports conditioning opportunities with our coaches in very small group settings with very heavy safety precautions in place. And then we moved into the conversation about opening of school. Many of our groups had to do similar things when they talked about, okay, what's right in front of us? And then how are we planning for August? And they've balanced those things very, very well. Next slide. Another thing that guided our discussions were the results of the surveys that we sent out. You might remember we sent out surveys at the end of May of the school year May, for our student staff and parents to give us feedback about the closure and considerations that we should be making as we plan for the opening of the school year. The response was really overwhelming. We had over 27,000 people answer, answer our, our survey to ask. This was a large portion of our community and the information has been very important to us as we designed our opening of school plan. Next, please. Here are some of the responses to the survey questions we asked based on family situations and personal concerns about safety and health. If, if you could choose a mom for your student next year, which one would you choose? Would you choose to attend school full time in person? Would you choose to learn remotely or would you like some sort of modified program with time at school and some remote learning? Here's what they said. Next slide. As you can see, overwhelmingly, and I'm showing you the parent data just for, re for reference. We also have student data and we have teacher data. But from the parent's perspective, overwhelmingly, um, at 61%, they prefer an in-person option. Uh, you know, a small, a small percentage said they wanted to learn remotely from home. And then uh, the other portion obviously chose the modif some sort of modified option. So that guided our thinking as we looked at our uh, design team. Next up. We also asked, in ad addition to the enhanced cleaning, what other changes should we consider as part of our safety plan? So when we think about opening in person, having a safety plan in place, what are the things that we should be considering? And here's what we saw on the next slide. We see the results of people wanting physical distancing and restricting in common areas. You can see that, and the way that this was worded was, um, what impact does it have on the decision you're gonna make if we uh, ha ask everybody to maintain a six foot distance? For 49.7%, it had no impact on their decision. Um, for some, it was they would be less likely to send their their children back to school if we did it that if we maintained that six foot distance. Um, interestingly, on the use of common areas being restricted or eliminated, 41% said if we did that, they would be less likely to send their students back. So I think that's an interesting um, uh, an interesting look into the what the parents were thinking at the end of May. Okay, up next, face mask. Thank you. Uh, I can see we have how people feel, the parents feel anyway, about students wearing face masks. 34.7% said it had no impact, and 26% said they'd be more likely to send their students to school if they knew that they were wearing face masks. 39.4% said they would be less likely. So if you put the, together the no impact or the more likely, there's a, you know, you can make some assumptions there. 
but this data all drives the conversations that we're having. And the idea of daily temperature checks also played a role in our conversations. Next up. We asked about what, what should what, what should we restrict, right? Restrict or eliminate recess. That was not very popular. I'll tell you that. 54% said, no, don't do that. Uh, I would be less likely to send my students to school. And the same thing with extracurricular activities and or sports. Um, so what we, you know, what we can infer is that our families would like these options to be available to our students with um, as safely as possible is, is how we're, we're interpreting that data. So on the next slide, this is the survey results. Our design teams created three choice options that we listed here. There will be an opportunity, there will be an in-person opportunity, a modified in-person opportunity, and remote learning. I'm going to spend some time today sharing with you the specifics of each of these plans. Our plans are still in the draft stages. We're starting the conversation with you today with the goal of getting your feedback. Next week, we'll be asking you to make some considerations for your family about which of these options you would choose. They, these will help us in the planning process to take these plans from drafts to action plans. Until we know how many people are interested in each of these options, we are unable to fully create our action plans. And just so you know, in the teacher plan, we also share that we're going to be surveying them about their preference about what model they would prefer to teach in also. So um, there will be, in addition to the parent survey that we'll be asking for them to choose their children, we're including a staff survey. And those will happen in the next week. Okay, Cody, next slide. For each of these plans, you will see us talk about eight things. The safety protocols apply to each of the plans and they are consistent. So you will see us talking about classroom experience, breakfast and lunch, transportation, sports activities. We will talk around the safety protocols around hand hygiene, health assessment, face coverings, and visitors on campus. All of these things will be important to us as we talk about talk through these plans. Next slide, please. So begin with talking about uh, the in-person option. This will, see, this will be most like normal school with significantly enhanced safety precautions. So let's review those on the next slide, some of those. In-person for us includes the following safety measures. We are asking that parents check their children at home before they leave for school. And if they exhibit any of the specific symptoms related with COVID-19, we expect students to remain at home. We will share those symptoms as a part of our beginning of the year safety training. We feel this is a practical solution as opposed to, tempt as opposed to attempting to take the temperatures of every student as they walk on campus every morning. We feel that parents are the best judge and able to help us with this health assessment. We will ask for assigned awareness forms at the beginning of the year that will say that, you, that parents attest to do this process at home before they send their children to school. We also ask every student to bring their own water bottle and a clean face covering with them to school every day. We will be limiting access to water fountains. Fountains will only be used to refill water bottles. They will not be used for um, access to drinking. If your student is a bus rider, you will see that all bus monitors and drivers will be required to have face covering and students who ride the bus will also be required to wear a face mask. Family members, and what be asked to sit together and assign seatings will be possible. On the next slide, students can expect to see physical distancing measures in place. Common areas before and after school will not be open. Students will arrive at school and go directly to their classroom. Transitions will be minimized whenever possible, and teachers will do the transition between classrooms as opposed to moving students through the building during the day whenever possible. An example of that might be instead of moving students to an art classroom at the elementary, perhaps the art teacher comes to the classroom. High schools and junior highs are also looking for ways to minimize transitions, perhaps like directional hallways we've seen in some stores or other opportunities to reduce the number of transitions during the day. Recess will happen on our elementary school campuses with physical distancing being encouraged and classrooms of students being released together as opposed to being mixed with other classes. In the classroom, desks will be physically distanced and facing forward. As often as possible, materials will not be shared, and any materials that have to be shared will be sanitized between use. Electives and special classes 
will use the same type of procedure, safety procedures that the classroom teachers will be using. Shared materials will be sanitized between usage and opportunities for individualized materials will be prioritized. Next up. For breakfast and lunch, the elementary schools will eat in the classroom whenever possible. Classroom cleanings will be spaced apart in the cafeteria when eating in the classroom is not possible. At the junior and senior high schools, additional lunch periods will be considered to allow for more physical distancing. For athletics and extracurriculars, there will be no junior high sports for the first quarter. Schedules will be adjusted for the remainder of the year, depending on space availability. The Interscholastic Association, Arizona Interscholastic Association, AIA, released guidelines for competitions this summer. High school sports will follow these recommended guidelines. We are holding conditioning sessions with small groups of athletes and coaches now, and we hope to expand those offerings throughout the summer. In our visual and performing arts programs, safety protocols will be in place, including plans to sanitize shared instruments and materials. It will be a priority to reduce the amount of materials and instruments that need to be shared. Up next, on this slide, we share some of our specific safety precautions that include an increased focus on hand hygiene. At the elementary school level, we will have specific times of day that we encourage washing hands or using hand sanitizer. At the junior high and senior high, we will also have hand washing protocols and access to hand sanitizer throughout the building on campus. Face coverings are recommended by the CDC as the healthiest option and the best way to prevent the spread of COVID-19. As we learn more about the effectiveness of face coverings, we know face coverings are important to student and staff safety. With the recent information from our mayor in Maricopa County, face covering requirement plans will be developed for our students and staff with thoughtful and practical guidelines that take into consideration special circumstances within our population. We will not be allowing visitors on campus or volunteers on campus unless it's for the specific safety or well being of the students. Parents will be invited to come to the front office, but not go beyond unless it's for the safety or well being of their child. And all safety protocols must be followed by those entering our buildings. So, you've heard the in person plan. This is where we stop and take a poll. So I'm going to ask an out loud question and ask for some, some conversation. The first question that we ask our administrators today is tell us one positive about the plan, something that you liked right off From the bat. In-person plan. Are you looking for our feedback? I am. I like that we're looking for ways to get the kid back on the campus. Excellent. Thank you. I like the increased focus on hand washing and uh, and hand sanitizing stations around campuses. Great. Mrs. Minor or Mrs. Hutchinson? I do I do like that uh, we are using um, um, the uh, methods and means um, to stop the spread of the virus that have been on uh, recommended by CDC, FDA, um, and so that we are using um, guidelines um, that our people are familiar with and that we have been told by the scientists will curtail the spread of the disease. So I think that's a real positive. Thank you. Mrs. Miner. I would say all of those things as well. I also like that you're going to be um, keeping visitors um, off campus so that we don't go to all of these efforts and then we have visitors come in and maybe not follow those particular those particular protocols or bring in things from the outside environment that we're working so hard to protect in in our school. So I think that's for this time is probably uh, something that I would support and, and feel good about because I I would know that when my child goes to the school that they are working hard to um, minimize any outside 
um, contamination, I guess you could say, that sounds like an extreme <laughs> word, <laughs> but that we're keeping things, um, all the protocols inside to, for the best benefit of our children. Yeah, thank you for that. I don't think that Mrs. Sears has joined us yet. I, I scrolled through, I didn't see her yet. So hopefully she'll join us before we're finished. Um, so the next question that we asked administrators today is what one challenge do you see with the in-person plan or something that you, you find troublesome? Um, I, the one challenge I find a little troublesome, and I don't know if there's a solution to this, but I know there's several elementary schools and even high schools and, and junior highs, but I see it more often in elementary schools where they use different classroom configurations in their innovation. So they're, whether it's the, because of their curriculum, their style of learning, whatever that is, there's a variety of ways that they have designed their classrooms where the, they don't have the chairs all sitting in, and pointing to one direction. And in some situations, they don't have all chairs there or, or desks. They have just tables. They even have sofas and lofts and, you know, some real imaginative things that um, are a lot of fun to kids and um, encourage learning and socializing and cooperative learning. So I, I, of course, understand the challenges with that. But I'm wondering, is there, and I know you can't answer all these questions today. This is input, not solutions yet. But um, I'm wondering if there are some solutions where we can still follow safety protocols, but have innovative um, arrangements in the classrooms configurations? Those are good questions. Thank you, Mrs. Miner. Anyone else like to share a concern that they, they noticed? Yeah, I think, I think my concerns um, were my positive. Um, having been a classroom teacher, um, we don't have nearly enough places for frequent hand washing or, or sanitizing to take place. Um, if you're talking about the bathrooms, the bathrooms are, they're, they're gonna be germ havens. So um, I, I see a problem with frequent hand washing, um, uh, particularly at the, at the secondary level. Um, the other issue that I'm, that I'm worried about is face coverings and water bottles be, as an equity issue. Um, I'm wondering how parents with multiple kids and the way that face coverings are supposed to be done and washing them, will, will, will parents be able to afford the face coverings and the water bottles? Um, and, and this may be an area where we may have to ask the community for help. Um, I don't know if it's um, sewing masks or if it's providing water bottles, but um, um, I, I see that as, a, as an equity issue that that's, it's hard enough to get supplies for kids to start school, but now we're adding to that list. And so I worry about the equity issue there. That's very good feedback. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I've written both of those down for Mrs. Minor and Mrs. Hutchinson. What else? What else do you see as a um, challenge with the plan? I'm not sure I've heard anything that would indicate how the other school districts around us and the charter schools are addressing these issues. Uh, if they're approaching this particular uh, pandemic, in our, especially in our computing, competing districts and charter schools, if they're addressing this in a much different way, I'm, I'm deeply concerned about the feelings that the parents are going to have. And I'm not sure that we've really listened to the parents and what you've presented in the sense that you know the vast majority of them did not want face coverings, but yet we're saying we want face coverings. Uh, somehow you're you're not in sync there with what the parents are telling you. Uh, it sounds like to me we've taken the safe road, uh, and and I understand why. I think it's it's great if we could do that, but I'm not sure the as I've mentioned before that the free enterprise system is going to allow us to do that. If we strictly take what's the guidelines of everyone around, you know, that we're getting from the CDC and others and follow those, uh, as I mentioned several times, I'm, I'm gravely concerned that our parents will choose other options, whether it be stay at home with, stay at home and form their own uh, groups, uh, shift to another school district or do something else and not really 
uh, see us as, as a viable choice because of the restrictions that we're putting on our on their kids. That's my probably my biggest concern. Sure, that's a good concern. And I, and I have a wondering around that too, Mr. Peterson, about um, we, we know that the conversation around face coverings has changed in the last couple of weeks too. And we asked those questions of our, of our families at the end of May and then now here mid June, things, things have ramped up significantly in Arizona. So I have a wondering if the data would show us if it would be different or if it would be the same. And so until we ask the next round of questions or for feedback, I'm not sure that we'll have a good sense on that. I will say that um, talking to the other districts and making sure that we're in line with what they're planning is something that we're, I, you know, we're, we're, we're aware of and we're watching the other plans. Some other districts came out before us. And so it was easy to take a little sneak peek and say, okay, are they, are they on a radical road that we're not on? Um, and so we're, we are, we are tapped into that, but I think that will be an ongoing important thing for us to continue to do for sure. Cause we don't want to be too far out of line with what others are doing because we do want, don't want to lose to, especially to our border districts where parents have an easy, maybe an easier opportunity to make a decision different than choosing these in public schools. So I agree with you there. Absolutely. Thank you for that feedback. Mrs. Richardson? I share Stephen's concern. Um, I think that I would tell you, I've spent a lot of time mm -hmm. reading emails that we've received as a governing board, uh, having people approach me and talk to me, and certainly face masks are a, a lightning rod of strong feeling, both pro and con. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I would, I would imagine that your data that said nearly uh, forty percent of your families are less likely to send their kids to school if they're required a face mask, especially at an elementary level. Um, I think my my number one concern is that it, in our effort to be safe, we have maybe hampered uh, the ability for our especially elementary school students to enjoy school. That if they're if they don't have a friend assigned in their classroom, then that's who they're going to be at recess with. They won't eat lunch in a cafeteria. They won't, you know, they, they won't move to special school. It's going to be a lot of, they can't congregate. It's a long time of sitting for small wiggly bodies, unable to do what they do naturally. And as they want to, I mean, I was just thinking of watching my kids play soccer when they're little. And it's, I think we've called it, you know, Bumble ball or something like that because they just there's just a clump of kids following a ball. They're all in a mass because that's the way they do it. They sleep like puppies at my house when they're little. They want to, you know, they're close to each other. And so uh, my concern is that we are not only balanced, that we're balancing safety with um, practicality and with uh, parent desire for what they want their campus to look like. Um, and it still leaves this. Element Thank you for that. I'm having some um, earbud problems, so I apologize for that. I'm gonna turn my camera off for a second as I untangle. I appreciate that feedback, and I think that that's an important piece to what we're talking about is making sure that we are balancing all those voices as they as they give it to us. Do we have Mrs. Sears with us yet? I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not able to kind of keep up with who's in the room. Not yet. Okay, the Ooh. last thing I want to bring up is um, the last question we asked our administrators today is what are we not thinking about? What, what is it in our plan that, that you see that we are missing thinking about? I, I, think, it, I think one of the things that we're, we're not seeing in the plan is the voice of the employees. Because while while it seems like we're focusing on parent choice, um, we don't have school if we don't have employees. And if employees who have compromised immune systems, who have who are are young and 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 want to have families, who have who live in multi generational families, if we don't have a safe working environment, we don't have school. Period. And so I think while it's very important to listen to parents, we also have to listen to scientists and, and those that would create 
a safe working environment where our employees will come back to work. I, we have to remember that we have a teacher shortage. We have a bus driver shortage. We have an age shortage. And what I'm not seeing in the plan is the voice of employees. And, and I've had some emails on that as well. So I'm, I'm concerned that we, that we, that that's coming up and that this was just the, the, the start. And that's what I'm hoping, um, Mrs. Williams. You know, there's so many details that you have yet to work through and that I understand that this is feedback. So you can take all of the input and develop a plan and then add the details as you possibly can. Um, but I would say the one thing that I noticed when I think of all of the keeping the kids apart and not having a large recess time and lunch time where they're able to, um, in the case of elementary school, where they're not able to see their friends that may be in another class or on the playground or, or do some of those things that are socializing for children, because it isn't just <clears throat> learning in, in school that takes place. There is a social developmental um, piece to going to school that we want to make sure we're not extracting when we are trying to put in all of our place all of these protocols. I look at the social emotional well being of our children. And over the summer, I have been observing how challenging it has been for some children to be isolated from other children and how this has affected their morale. There, some kids are getting more depressed. We've heard all of that. Um, so that is, if we become so sterile that we forget one of the big reasons we have them come together and why they choose not to have online school because there's so many benefits from being in a social setting and social setting means contact, being closer. So I understand that that is where the challenge lies and there's hardly room for compromise in this situation because there's very strong feelings on both sides of the fence. Um, I think you can find science on both sides as well. I know we've heard from some experts on why all of these protocols are very important, but there's also experts that are coming out and talking about the social emotional issues that they are very, very concerned that they are watching occur during this isolation period or separation from each other. So I, I would say that that would be a piece that we definitely have to consider as part of health. Sorry, turn off my phone. President, here. President Minor, uh, Board Member Hutchinson, I uh, just would like to make a, a remark uh, about you had shared about what teachers want or what their perspective is. Please know that over the course of the next week or so, when we complete the focus groups, uh, Mrs. Hollins, Dr. Carlisle, uh, Dr. Forless and Mrs. Williams are collaborating on the appropriate communications with all parents regarding each of their children and all teachers or those individuals that are working with children. Uh, we're looking to get their feedback after they see, hear, feel, give feedback on, I, I guess, what, what possibility they're interested most in. You know, we, we want them to be able to select where they're at. So with regards to teachers, you know, I want to say probably, you know, shortly after, uh, shortly after the 4th of July, Mrs. Hollins, we should have some feedback from, you know, all of our teachers and parents as far as where they stand at this moment regarding these three instructional possibilities. And, and I think Mrs. Williams will talk with you a little bit more about that later in this presentation. The other thing I would add to uh, Mrs. Williams to on this would be uh, probably even clear up at your key items that you uh, that you list as far as uh, safety choice. I think sitting up there is going to have to be uh, very close. It would be flexibility. Uh, we don't know whether we're looking at an at a, a uh, an ice cube or whether we're looking at an iceberg. 
that's coming down the path. And we don't know whether we may be closing the schools completely come August, or it might be, it might just peter out and back to normal. So somehow if you can continue to, to, to communicate that this is, this is our current spot. And I think as Mrs. Hutchison said earlier to Andy about uh, one spot to go for, for uh, sources of information is somehow they can, if here's the latest spot you can go to get her our, la our latest standards on where we're at in dealing with being listening to our parents and to our community and to our stakeholders and our teachers to be as responsible and flexible as possible. That, that would be my feedback as far as what I could see would need to be more effective. Mr. Peterson, this is Pete Lesser. Uh, I would tell you, I, I think uh, Mrs. Williams is having a little bit of difficulty with being logged in or having the phone. I'm back. How are you? I'm back. So, I am. Thank you. <laughs> I was just going to say something about you that almost every meeting that we have, you say, as of today, <laughs> this is what we're doing. You know, <laughs> so you could speak further about uh, your, your usual lead into the meetings. I do say that, that this is the plan as of uh, June 23rd, and it has morphed in the past week. It will continue to because as we learn more, we adjust. So I agree with you, Mr. Peterson. Flexibility is going to have to be our middle name this year. And the other thing that I keep sharing is that we're going to have to um, have a position of grace. We have to allow ourselves to breathe and to come at this with the knowledge that it's not going to be perfect, but we're going to give it our best shot to do to do what we can in the best interest of our with the lens of safety and choice. And I, I think that if we continue to give ourselves grace, allow grace for those families who are feeling anxious and don't see that every single thing that they like reflected in the plan, that we will we will come a long way together. I, I think that there's opportunities process for us to get to a really good place and to understand that in times of uncertainty and kind of scary times for some, that we are the very best we can with the information we have on June 23rd. <laughs> and we will continue to evolve as we know more. So I thank you for that because I, I do start I do start every meeting that way, Pete, with hey. This is today, uh, PS 42 days till school starts. <laughs> In case you wanted that and, countdown, I haven't updated you tonight yet. And, and uh, President Minder, I'd also like to uh, respond to the, the uh, comment about employees. The data that you have before you this evening is the data that we have collected from our parents. We have the, that same set of data from our employees. So all of our teams have been um, studying student responses, parent responses, as well as employee responses. So um, I'm glad that you brought that up, Mrs. Hutchinson, so we can clarify that we've got lots and lots of data. We do. Do we and feel okay very about similar. moving on? Interestingly enough, it's very similar. It is, you're right, it is. Um, are we comfortable moving on to the modified in-person? I missed a tiny bit because I lost all sound and had to go back out. So if we're okay, I'm gonna move down the strip script and we'll have another little discussion. Go ahead. Mrs. Williams, did you hear me? Did you hear everything I said? <laughs> I, heard, I heard some of it. Mrs. Minor, I love it. Oh, no. But I know that Mr. Dr. Lester told me he was taking copious notes. So no, that, okay. that was Dr. Forless is taking copious notes. Oh, got it. Yes. She's a good one at note taking. So thank you for supporting me in that. You know, <laughs> technology some days works and some days it's just a challenge. So, I know. okay, Cody, if you would move on to the next slide, that would be fantastic. Thank you. So now we're going to discuss the modified in person and I will share with you anecdotally that we worked a lot on this today. Um, knowing that some of these definitions in here aren't where we want them to be. So we spent some time with our leaders this afternoon, kind of trying to get to a better place. I don't have that in the presentation yet because that will be what's coming next, but we we did work on this today and I wanted you to know that. So on the next slide. The safety precautions and protocols that we will use for the in person instruction will be the same as for the modified in-person, for the days the student attends schools in person. Students will be given a district laptop to ensure learning happens five days a week. Even though a student may attend fewer school days or hours each day, the learning expectations will be for every day. The instruction will be geared to be a continuation of the classroom learning and designed to help students keep progressing. On the next slide. So modified in-person is a blended model 
a portion of the day learning happens in the classroom in person and the other portion happens remotely. For elementary students, we're proposing a blended model of both in-person and remote learning where a student would attend in person days a week with a rotating Wednesday every other week. The example would be a student would attend on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday in week one, and on the week two, they would attend on Monday and Thursday. So every other day they would attend, and the other student then would be on the Tuesday, Friday with the rotating Wednesday schedule. And allows for us to split classes in half, allowing for greater physical distancing and reducing the number of hours a student spends at school. Learning will continue on the days not in person via remote learning. At the junior and senior high level, the plan looks a little different. Um, it is not as well defined because students choose courses that they want to take in both junior and senior high. We are proposing a plan that includes both remote and in-person learning as the modified in-person with specific details to be developed once we know how many students would choose this option. One example could be similar to the elementary, but it could also be attending for specific courses in the morning and then going home for remote learning through our Mesa Distance Learning Program. I throw that as an option, but that's what our leaders were talking about today is what would it look like? Um, the elementary, you know, hashed out some details about what that could look like on their campuses. And then the junior high and high school teams um, met also to discuss, okay, what is that going to look like? And I don't have answers for you tonight, but I know that that's a topic of conversation that we continue to try to, to develop that more fully. Because when we offer these options to our families, we want them to have a clear understanding of what they're, what they're choosing when they choose that. So now that you've heard what we know about the modified so far, let's do the same poll questions. What's one thing you like about the option of modified in person? I like that it allows for fewer kids in a classroom. Mm -hmm. Right. And and the possibility of, of uh, better social distancing as a result. And I think it might even give that word flexibility to the, the arrangement of the classroom that might, might not have to necessarily be in the straight rows that because you'd have more room, you might have some flexibility. Um, and, um, and it, 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 it allows teachers to work with a smaller group. It allows them to, to touch base with kids at least two times a week um, in, in, in a smaller setting, not with, not with um, a huge group of kids. We're worried about every single kid um, um, doing the protocols. Um, I, I totally agree with, with board member Richardson. It's, uh, it splits the classes in half and, and makes it a lot more manageable, I think, every day. I like it. I like it because I think it gives another layer of comfort for parents and it also gives more choice for those. It's not always black and white where you either feel strongly on one side or on the other. This to me is a compromise and a moderation of both feelings because we hear all the time or most often some very strong feelings about this issue. And so I appreciate that this is kind of a compromise on both sides. I concur with what's been uh, stated. Nothing additional. Are there any challenges with this one that you would like to share or, or concerns that you have about the modified in person that are different than the than maybe what you shared in the in person option? I think keeping consistent curriculum seems to come to my mind. How do you keep uh, a consistent learning process when you've got them on campus for a bit, the teacher, and then at home for a bit. Uh, how do you effectively do that? That's great feedback. I believe that, that children are very adaptable and they will adapt to different schedules and they learn quite quickly. I guess the only concern I would have is the management of this seems to be a a little bit of a nightmare <laughs> when you think of all the different schedules and different kids and different teachers and different classrooms that that's going to be interesting to watch you guys uh, plan that out and the schools, the different schools will probably have different approaches. I would imagine. So that would probably be the thing that would be the toughest part of this is managing it. We're for this sure is, doing a little storming around that today, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> this is Mrs. Minor. You you make an excellent comment about 
the management of it. One of the first things that I think our group came up with is some families have two, three, four children that are at a particular elementary school. And so coordinating their efforts so there's a level of consistency in mm -hmm. how their children are attending and, and half of them aren't coming, well, maybe they want half to come on, you know, Mondays and Thursdays and the other half, or, or they want them to come on all the same days. But you're right, that's another layer of managing uh, just the, the attendance of children at school that help families and, and align with uh, our efforts to support our community. I worry about kids having the self-discipline to take on the responsibility of the learning, um, um, using the devices and, and whatever. But then I think, you know, thinking of Portrait of the Graduate, that we, we would be preparing them for college because a lot of ASU courses uh, have, are a hybrid model. Um, where you you come in, you do the value of class discussion is very important, but you have to be prepared to do that, and you do that on your own. Um, I also think that that's the way college operates, um, and I'm I'm thinking also a lot of technical schools. There there is there is expectations that you will do, you will prepare, and then you will perform with others. Um, so uh, in some ways, I see it. Not, this might not work for all kids. But then I'm also seeing it as an opportunity to prepare them for the future uh, and the way that they'll learn in the future. So. I'm going to pick up Mrs. Hutchinson's uh, porch and say the, the place I feel like this is really, I, I know that we've all received a lot of emails that have even highlighted a different uh, hybrid model uh, that's floating around and being proposed and there's a lot of pieces I like with that and there's a lot of pieces that I think could be problematic but um, I am I understand from employees that they have a high level of concern about how this looks for them that managing kids in their classroom all day and then still managing half their kids who work there online you know is it two different teachers that are managing that and some of them want to choose a in person model because they um, because they don't have a high comfort level themselves with the online format. And so, you know, there's there's a lot of things that um, that you know that go my my concern in this model mostly is I think the kids are adaptable. They'll figure things out. Families can tailor for them. I think it's the employees who are more afraid of this model. And what does that look like for their caseload and 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 what does that look like? You know, I um, and I don't think today, today is necessarily the time to talk through this, but I would hope that your group would be talking through. I have had a lot of parents reach out to me and say to them, this blended model makes a lot more sense in an AM PM model and morning and an afternoon instead of full days. And and it and it makes more sense to me, too. In a lot of ways, and I understand there's, you know, transportation issues that are a concern. There's cleaning issues that are a concern. There's other things that are concerned. But to me, if, if I were picking a hybrid model, it wouldn't look like Monday, Thursday, every other Wednesday. It would look like every morning for 2 and a half or 3 hours or every afternoon for 2 and a half or 3 hours. And, and families who feel overwhelmed, you know, even parents who are working from home who are trying to help kids. If they send two of their kids in the, you know, if they rotate, so they don't have all their kids home at one time, that might be an easier management for them if they're working from home. I, I know that that's a whole nother wrench and that's not the topic we're discussing today, but um, I think it's, I think it's important for us to mention that we have heard that as a suggestion and a possibility. And while I really re recognize there are some big logistical issues with that, um, there's some big wins with it as well, as far as consistency and daily contact and easier management from a teacher standpoint about what's getting taught every day and what's assigned at home. Yes, thank you for that. We have received that feedback and our design teams have talked through some of that and will continue to talk through that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. What else? Anything else on that one? Okay, I'm going to move on to the remote learning then. So if we would go to the next slide, thank you so much, Cody, I appreciate you. 
Um, so remote learning in Mesa Public Schools has existed for many years at our secondary level. And for the 2021 school year, we are adding the opportunity for students to learn remotely in grades pre-K through 12. We've purchased a new remote learning curriculum for our young learners that will facilitate the remote learning at the elementary level. Students grade kindergarten through six will have access to laptops, and we feel this may be an option that some families will be interested in. Specials will be available virtually throughout the semester, and students can choose to transition back to in-person learning at the semester break. Social emotional support will be provided in the remote setting and both student, for both student and family well-being. In the secondary setting, all students will have access to a district provided laptop and they will be enrolled in our Mesa distance learning program. Students will be able to pick the courses they'd like to take for the semester and at semester break, they can choose to transition back to the in person learning. And we will also provide social emotional support for students and families via remote learning opportunities. Mesa Public Schools has been a leader in remote learning at the high school level for many years. We are excited to add the elementary grades to this remarkable program and believe that it will meet the needs of many in our community who are looking for this option. So we are, this is another place, this is not, a, not one that we um, had to say much about because this is something that we have in place already. And those people who want remote learning, um, it's, it, you know, we've kind of lived it in the spring. And so they know uh, without, um, having the elementary curriculum, they'll know now that we have this great opportunity for some high quality online curriculum that we're going to offer for our youngest learners. So I'd like to ask you, um, are there any pros or cons or concerns that you'd like to share about this one? And I'll just open it a little differently because it's, it's a little, um, um, it's a little different. Tracy's, Tracy's um, giving me a little nudge that she wants me to not forget something. So I may call on her um, before you guys start talking. So Tracy, do you want to jump in and add your thought? Sorry, I was just um, nudging to remind you that we need to edit this slide a little just to, with our language around MDLP and our, our digital online curriculum. And I think when we get to that point, if there's questions, I can answer those around that piece, which address some of the teacher concerns that um, you were sharing about how do I manage both? We've we've purchased an online curriculum so that teachers don't have to design and learn Canvas and learn the digital curriculum, do all these things while also designing lessons. It'll help facilitate that piece. So we're learning a little bit more each day. So um, students will still be enrolled in their home school in a remote learning situation, but it won't be through MDLP. Thank you, Tracy. That's a good clarification. And we will add that to the to script so that we can make sure that we're saying that out loud. But thank you for that. I just wanted to remind myself and you before we move. Oh. <laughs> perfect, perfect timing. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, uh, governing board members, are there um, ideas or concerns or pluses for this program? Do you tell us your thoughts on remote learning? I think to what you've just addressed as far as what does it mean for distance learning for especially the elementary ages. Uh, is that is that curriculum already developed? If it is, where to come from? Uh, what quality is it? Uh, we've heard a number of feedback, I'm sure you have as well, that, the, that what we were able to deliver for the last quarter of the 1920 year uh, was not to the level that parents would want because of the short notice we have. And so what have we been doing, obviously anxiously engaged in to better uh, have a product that would that would now meet their needs and would draw parents to it of a quality and a level that they would feel comfortable having their kids take that from home. So especially for me, it's, it's the, that K through six curriculum. Yes, and the, the curriculum, Tracy, I don't know if you wanna talk specifically about the vetting process and how confident you feel in it, but it sounds like a very good product for our teachers. Sure, this, yeah, this is Tracy. Um, we actually had, Obviously, still a very short timeline, so we had to um, have a team that looked into some products that were not only on a uh, state contract because of the procurement laws and the timeline that we have for, you know, needing to ensure that we're, we're maintaining that. We had to look at the legislation and how we might be able to um, capture instructional minutes and those pieces. Um, and then most importantly, what was some evidence based curriculum out there that would align to our state standards and help integrate, it would integrate with our, our Canvas system, our platform that is our Mesa Public School system so that we would have some uniform training. I know one of the concerns from parents fourth quarter 
um, also surfaced around, you know, where do I go? I've got all these different platforms and this is a front door platform through Canvas where um, teachers, students, parents will be able to access um, the Florida virtual. So um, it's an evidence-based curriculum. We had our specialists and some, some MDLP teachers and folks take a look at um, the alignment of that to our standards and we'll be training um, all of our, our elementary teachers in that system. And then we'll have some differentiation as well as they continue to become more proficient with um, our learning platform with the curriculum and then be able to mix in some other tools if needed. So hopefully that answered some of your questions. That was very good. Thank you, Tracy. So my concerns, um, I have several with this. One of them is just how do you maintain these students still feeling part of a school community? You know, they're, they, I don't want them to feel like they're nebulous Mesa public school students floating out there with 65 other students, but 65,000 other students, how do they feel part of their neighborhood school or their traditions of their, you know, in the loop on their high school? Because hopefully a lot of these students will want to transition back to their mm -hmm. uh, brick and mortar school as, as health conditions change or as their situations change. And so um, how, how do you maintain that feeling of connectedness with their home campuses and um, a, a, a concern I have already of MDLP is just, is it, is it really approachable for the average or for a C student? You know, is it, is it somebody who maybe struggles a little bit with reading and reading comprehension? Can they get what they need out of an online? Um, can they get the support they need to be successful? And certainly as we've rolled out more online teachers in our summer school format, there's a learning curve for the teachers to teach this way. And sometimes they accidentally lock students out of classes and sometimes they are slow on their feedback and their student can't do their work because they can't get open the next section they need. And, and so if we have a bunch of teachers who are new to this format, I'm worried that it could be a frustrating experience for a student and a family as they, you know, I'm worried that the need for grace and patience would outweigh their their reservoir of it, uh, <laughs> because it would be such a new steep learning curve for people that it wouldn't it wouldn't be possible for them. Yep, that's fair. That's good. Well, I would like to piggyback on what Mrs. Richardson said. It's not uh, it's not only a huge learning curve for teachers, but my goodness for parents. Um, we're going to, we're going to have, uh, devices in the hands of kids that the parent has to know how to, how to work the device. And then if there's new platforms like canvas and whatever, um, I, I see, I can see parents getting very frustrated, um, as they were in the spring, but I mean, it just means that we're going to have to not only train our teachers, but we're going to have to train our parents, we're going to have to train the kids uh, and and I'm, I'm afraid of the, um, the, the burden that that's going to place on our tech people, um, though they have they have done a, a miraculous job this this spring. Um, but um, I, I, I worry about um, that lack of connectedness, as you said, uh, board member Richardson, um, to me, this is. Um, this is really sterile um, and it would take I, I, I maybe, though, we can take some lessons from business because business has had to change the way they do business. And somehow businesses have figured out how to be collaborative, how to still have a sense of community with um, with technology and using technology. So. Maybe we could get some support from um, the business community on how to do this. That just uh, thinking out loud. I'm sorry. Tracy's just giving me another reminder to share with you that uh, EdTech has, has created some parent boot camp opportunities for some of the things that you're talking about. So yes, we are we are thinking through those things and how can we make um, some of the bumps in the road a little smoother for the, just the things that you're talking about. So I appreciate they are remarkable people in that department who do amazing things and um, they are thinking on those lines and creating they're calling them uh, boot camp opportunities for the different technologies 
I would, I would echo everything that's been said so far and my concerns. And I, I would echo um, board member Richardson on customizing it a little bit towards each of the campuses, if there's any possible way to do that. So they feel like they are still engaged and a part of that campus, because we know that all of our campuses have a different personality and uh, some of them have different approaches to the curriculum um, or, and are in different places in the curriculum, et cetera. The other issue I would be concerned about is because this is a new, uh, especially at the elementary level for parents and they aren't as familiar with what they are signing up for, and they they have to be committed to that for the entire semester. They may get into it and recognize that this isn't the best alternative for their student, their child. Um, is there going to be some ability for them to opt out before the end of the semester? And I recognize that, first of all, that you don't have all the answers. So you don't have to answer that, but something as a consideration. But I recognize that it's not easy to give everyone an opportunity to change their mind midstream because that in itself can very be very disrupting to their education. So that would be those would be my two points for online. Those are great considerations. Thank you. Mrs. Sears, I see you. Do you have some some ideas that you'd like to share? I think you're on mute, Mrs. Sears. Thank, thank you. I've had the opportunity to look at a few different online um, platforms and different um, systems. Tracy, will you tell us um, what the actual um, different companies that we're using? So, because as parents um, are looking to look in that, I would like to um, actually just kind of Google what those things are, because there's always these free um, Kind of almost advertisements that tells you about that particular company and their software because um when i reached out to um tracy as i was uh, looking at some of the different ones i um realized that we were in a bid process uh when it came to um retaining um, services uh, i think particularly i was looking at third grade reading and the um, math and some companies that um, are in our market so definitely, I just would like to do that because I was very impressed with the interactive nature that I saw um, in a lot of the programs that's available um, K through six. And one thing that was really um, great for me, because I see myself as being someone who uses a computer all day, but not being as savvy as a lot of um, adults, and then yet yeah, definitely not kids, I had an opportunity to do some interactive work with a student and then they were like, I will teach you. <laughs> and it was really great how it all came together. So I think that's the other thing, the um, empowering of the child when it comes to um, that. So I think um, with the boot camp, and then actually having the students um, take on some ability for the navigation be, I'm not saying all of the responsibility needs to be on the student, but I did like even my interaction with the third graders was having them being empowered because they knew how to help me uh, maneuver through the different levels. Because I found um, with the experiment I was doing, it was on me being at various different levels and I am getting support in one area and then uh, being at a high level in another area. And it was really interesting um, what I saw. So it seemed as I'm inspired, but I do realize that um, the connectivity is a big thing. So I really liked what I saw. So I'm not gonna say any of the different things that I saw. I just want to know like what we're using. And um, cause that's the other thing. You do have a lot of teachers who are in our district who also have children so as we have the conversation, I, as a board member, and then I wanna say our fellow board members, it's good to at least know that. So when they start um, sharing the jargon with us, we'll know what they're talking about. 
So this is Tracy. Yes, and exactly what Mrs. Sears, you and I had talked about previously with the ELA adoption, and, and we're currently under a request for proposal. We had to, um, with a short timeline, consider um, those programs that were already under state contract because we just don't have enough time to go out for a full blown request for proposal for a, an elementary digital curriculum. So some of the pieces that we took into consideration were um, obviously the procurement laws, but then as far as the learning model goes, um, exactly that. What could integrate within the systems that we have within the public schools um, that would help with the alignment of, of training, of access, of um, helping parents and, and teachers really transition pretty quickly. And so part of that process was that our, our specialists and directors reached out to some of our partners. So, for example, some of the folks that are working with us um, and work with districts nationwide um, with our portrait of a graduate and our strategic plan had recommended some of the curriculum. And so our folks took a look and, and vetted those, those tools and that curriculum to see if it was aligned to our standards, to see if it would be an easy transition. Um, as um, some of you mentioned in, in regard to, you know, if students are, are transitioning out of the semester or, or perhaps somebody's sick and has to stay home for a couple of weeks or whatever that, that challenge might be, this was a curriculum that would allow kids and teachers to move back fluidly back and forth. Um, it will, it, it will allow teachers the opportunity to do some of those things that, that you talked about as it integrates with the Canvas platform. Um, teachers can, you know, use some of those new tools that will actually be in the elementary Canvas platform as far as recording and collaboration and navigation, and, and we can build some of the, the parent tricks and tools and tips in there as well um, in alignment with some of the parent boot camp courses. So um, I will certainly, we're, we just are finishing those, those negotiations this week, but I've got some sample links that um, Jennifer Eccles and her team have provided, and we're going to be sharing those with the principals and um, we'll be happy to send those your way. We've got a, a call tomorrow morning at 730 with um, with the Florida virtual is is the curriculum that we'll be using. Um, and, and we've met not only with the vendors, but also with some other school districts um, in particular in, in Florida. Uh, they use uh, in Pasco, Florida, a district that is uh, similar to our size and our makeup and, and what they've been doing with it um, when they had to emergency close last quarter as well. And, so we've reached out to a bunch of partners and practitioners and, and made sure that um, it offered all the courses that we needed um, that were in alignment. So Florida Virtual is the curriculum that, that we're looking at um, utilizing for this remote learning situation in, in K through six, and it'll be integrated in the Canvas platform. Thanks, Tracy. Okay, Tony, if we can, can move on, we'll, we'll kind of go on to the next couple of slides. So to recap, in Mesa Public Schools, we will have three choices for learning opportunities. We'll have an in-person, a modified in-person, and a remote learning opportunity. Hopefully everyone can find a space that they feel will meet their needs for the 2021 school year. We hope you see that safety and choice is reflected in each of these plans. The next slide. Our students and teachers have been out of school for five months. It's important that we adjust to the new environment, and we believe that offering an early release schedule for the first week of school can help us achieve that. This will allow students and staff to acclimate to an academic environment while taking care of their social emotional needs. At the end of the school day, staff will have the opportunity to debrief and refine processes and procedures and make adjustments based on the needs of the students. We will also be releasing early every Wednesday for teacher preparation and enhanced cleaning opportunities. You know, we recognize that this is going to be all new for us and we're looking at opportunities to allow for time and for planning and thoughtful consideration to what it takes for our um, students to, to, to work in this unique environment, but also our staffs to, to, uh, to work in this unique environment. So thinking about Wednesdays offered us some flexibility there around allowing for um, some planning and some downtime to uh, to kind of reset ourselves. So, so this is one of the recommendation that we're making around the calendar. On the next slide, we have some other considerations that we'd like to share. Through our partnership with the city of Mesa, Cody, if you'll move forward for me, please. 
through our thank you for through our partnership with the city of Mesa, we've been very fortunate to receive a portion of their COVID-19 care funds to be able to support our students learning in the way of technology. We are purchasing laptops for each of our students. It's exciting to know that students from kindergarten, actually pre-K, through 12th grade will have a laptop and the laptops will or be ordered and expected in early September. We are excited for this opportunity, not just during this time of the pandemic, but for, for the door that it opens for us in teaching and learning moving forward. We are also thankful, thankful for the support of our city and the commitment they're making to the learning opportunities for the students of Mesa. For the fall semester, we're not gonna allow any field trips or staff travel for professional conferences. Many of these opportunities are not available as in-person experiences anyways, but we feel it's important to keep our students and staff safe so we will limit travel outside of the district. Our teams will be developing opportunities for virtual field trips and other experiences when we start in the fall semester. Travel for competition will be allowed with safety pro uh, precautions in place. We are limiting school events, such as assemblies and concerts, and they will be on modified schedules whenever possible. The experiences will be provided virtually for audience and community viewing. Mesa Public Schools continues to have a focus on the social and emotional well-being of our students and staff members, and that will be an extra emphasis for the 2021 school year. We know that this crisis has had a tremendous impact on the families of our community, and we want to be aware and prepared to support teachers, students, and families in their social emotional well-being. We will be offering trainings for parents, students, and staff on the safety protocols that we put in place. Training will also be available virtually this fall, and we will have signage throughout our campuses reminding all of the safety protocols we put in place. So what's next? The next slide we share. We are holding these feedback sessions on the, on the 18th, 22nd, and 24th, so we finish up tomorrow. And then beginning on the 25th, the feedback guides the sessions that we work with our design team. We'll use this feedback gathered um, from these groups to revise and enhance the plans that we have written. We know that these are drafts, and our opportunity with is this is our opportunity to share with you our best thinking and ask for your feedback about the direction we're heading. It's important that you share with us your thoughts so we can amend the plans as needed. In the next week's week or so, families and employees will receive an email asking them for, for them to choose a preference in the learning environment they'd like to participate in this fall. This information will be used to create the schedules and teaching assignments we will need to have in place to welcome students on August 4th. Our revised and final plans will be presented to the governing board on July 14th. We anticipate there being revisions to the overall plan because this plan is based on what we know now in June. As I shared at the beginning of the presentation, circumstances change in this pandemic from week to week. We will need to be prepared to revise and refine as needed and to meet the ever-changing circumstances as they come. What we learn from these presentations and what we hear from the state government and guidance from our leaders, we will adapt our plans and communicate these adaptations. Training will be provided in the safety protocols during this time before school starts, and teachers will receive training in the new remote learning tools and curriculum. So, and this is how we end. We share, we share the idea that we will continue to communicate throughout the summer as our plan evolves due to the changing circumstances in our state with the pandemic. And we remind them that the polls are open. We leave the poll up online for those folks who couldn't complete it maybe during the presentation and they'd like to go back and do it. We usually leave it open for the until nine o'clock that night and then we close them down and we get collect the data. So I just wanna end this presentation by saying, okay, you've heard the whole plan. We've added some things about the calendar and some ideas around our other considerations. So at this time, I would usually ask the parents to give us some feedback on the plan. And so I'm asking for overall um, on this last section from the governing board, what's your feedback around what you've heard um, in this last section? Before I get into the feedback on what we just heard, I wanted to first thank the mayor and the city council for making education a priority in our city and for the wonderful gift of computers for our elementary school children. That was a very thoughtful and just awesome that we, I can't express enough how much we appreciate that. So thank you, Mayor and City Council for that. <clears throat> Excuse me for that.
it's wonderful to see that commitment from our our city leadership around the education of the children. It's just a remarkable, and I I I know that I speak for many of us that we just feel very honored uh, that they are supporting our work and in this way. It, it's a it's a big investment in us and not one that we don't take lightly. And yes. um, and we appreciate that partnership that we have developed. My my thoughts are just centered around the words you uh, I think Dr. Forless said I hope you hear words like draft flexibility choice um, safety confidence you know that those are the words we hear and I I heard those and I and I appreciate that the um, I appreciate the understanding that there are a lot of unanswered questions that this is a starting place for conversation for and while it's a lot of thoughtful uh, work goes into it, you know, I, I have totally appreciate Mrs. Hutchinson's uh, statement that, you know, if we don't have teachers here, we can't open school. And, and I, and I believe also, if we don't have families here, mm -hmm. we can't afford to pay any teachers. So it's, you know, it, it's a, both voices are important for us to hear as we, uh, as we go forward and, and, um, you know, I, I am cognizant of the fact that we will never make everyone 100% happy with our options and our choices. And we can find a study that will say almost anything you want it to say about a lot of the recommendations or the things. And so knowing that it's really a balancing act of, of safety, data, um, emotion and, and fear and anxiety. And I appreciate you helping us navigate all of those things with flexibility, choice, confidence, safety. Um, I, I think we're gonna get to a really great option for our families in Mesa Public Schools so that we can continue to be the choice of more than 85% of the families that live within our school district. And that's what we want to be is the choice, the choice uh, that, we, we, that they trust us with their children and their learning. I would just like to say I appreciate the transparency, the um, uh, the feedback that we have been receiving, and you inviting to get the feedback. If parents haven't been giving their input yet, they still have an opportunity, from what I'm understanding. And we know that the more details and the more transparent we are, the more questions it raises. And we probably want to emphasize today again that because we don't have the plan fully developed because we're still taking the input that we don't have the the questions that they may have right now answered the detailed questions such questions that i've been getting and i know other board members have been getting as well are how do we go from one class to another at the high school level or are the teachers coming into the classroom a variety of questions that we're getting there are many uh, and I know that the district administration that's working on these plans don't have all the answers yet either, because these things are changing, as Mrs. Williams said, from day to day, depending on the circumstances. So I would just reach out to those who are watching and who were, we try to invite everyone to be watching today who have been sending us emails that we will get the answers to those questions. That is our intent. And we will get that information to you as soon as we possibly can. Right now, we don't. The governing board doesn't have the answers. We're just watching this unfold the same as all of the parents are seeing it unfold. And the administration and the teachers are all um, uh, our employees. Um, we are all working together to do the best we can under the circumstances. And we do want to get that information back to our families. And I appreciate all the work that everyone is putting into this. This is a group effort. This is a community effort trying to make the best of a very, very challenging and difficult situation that just got laid upon us um, at a moment's notice. So thank you for all your hard work, Mrs. Williams and for this presentation because it helped me to understand more thoroughly what has been going on behind the scenes. A lot of people think that the board members are involved in this process, but
but we are not. We are like the families out there who are watching today. We are listening most recently to this information because we have not been involved in the committees and we are not involved in the decisions that have been making that have been made thus far. If people want to know more about this, we can direct their questions to the appropriate people at administration, um, but we can't always answer them. But we will forward emails that we receive to the appropriate people in the district so you can get as many answers as we have available, of course. But most importantly, we want to be transparent. We want you to be involved. We understand that your children are of the utmost importance to you and they are the utmost importance to us. So I appreciate um, our board also for some very thoughtful questions and comments today. Thank you again. Thank you, Mrs. Miner. You know, I wanted to add, cause what you said just struck a, struck a chord with me because the question asking is a part of the feedback in my mind. I, I take that as, okay, that's something we need to address in the plan to make sure that they see those answers reflected. So if people weren't engaged and weren't asking questions, I'd be more worried because then they wouldn't be engaged in our in our our district and what we're doing. So I I don't take those as um, a bad thing. I take those as a very very good thing to show the level of engagement that we have, and I welcome questions comments because it means that we can take those to our design teams and we can say. These are the questions that people are asking. How are we addressing that in our plan moving forward and making sure that they see those answers? Now, they might not always like the answers. That's just the reality that Mrs. Richardson shared earlier, but we're going to do our very best to make sure they see their, their feedback and their answers reflected in the plan that we put forward to you on July 14th. So I appreciate the opportunity to share the work we're doing. You said it. It's not one person. It's a lot of people with a very heavy lift. And Dr. Forlis started this with, this is the most important work that we're doing for some. This might be the important, most important work we've ever done in our careers because this is, this is changing how we do education. We think we know what we've always done and it doesn't fit in that box anymore. And so how do we, how do we be flexible? and be cognizant that we want to offer as many opportunities to our families and keep them safe. Number one, keep them safe. That's always been what we've done. So I appreciate being the voice of it, but please know it's not me doing the work. They, there are a lot of people doing, doing remarkable things and I so appreciate them, um, the work that the thoughtfulness and the creativity that's involved. I, I shared with our team today that um, you know, the more we talk about it, the more excited I kind of get because the more heads in this um, help us get better at what we're thinking and uh, talking with our leaders today that really gave us an opportunity to even um, refine some of our thinking even better. So thank you for that. Well, and I will add to that, Mrs. Williams, that we have received some very good emails, some very thoughtful emails with good questions and good comments. I really have enjoyed reading the emails because I get a real pulse for how people are feeling out there and what they want. And for me, it's a great opportunity. So I welcome the questions and welcome comments because that's how we know what's going to make our community happy. And we know we can't make everyone happy, but we're going to do our darndest to make sure that we have at least listened to everyone and tried to make everyone happy. And that's a lot of work. You did that with the master plan by visiting all of the high schools and even some of the elementary, I still remember Lee High School that you visited and got the input from the families there and came up with some great ideas. And this has expanded that even in a bigger way. So you were experienced, you came into this being experienced. And so, wow, we are learning a lot of great lessons on how we can bring our community together in difficult times. So thanks to those who have voiced their opinion and who have gotten involved and let others know they can get involved too. We welcome you. We want you to be involved. This is your school, school system, and we want you to have a voice. Yay. One last plug for tomorrow morning from 8 to 10. Doesn't take two hours, but a little over an hour we'll be doing our uh, last in community engagement. So we welcome those who haven't had a chance to see it. If you didn't watch tonight, please, uh, if you missed any part of it, please join us tomorrow. And I'll share some data about our sessions in the, in the uh, regular meeting here in a little bit.
and Mrs. Williams, uh, that is three sessions tomorrow, community, staff, and students. Is that correct? That's right. And, and, but they're all happening at the same time. Right. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, can I have, make a comment about the response to emails? Because I know we've invited some people who've reached out to us to um, listen in tonight. And, um, you know, they're hearing how much we appreciate and uh, welcome their um, emails, but also just um, explain a little bit about being go governing board members and that we um, usually don't each respond to the um, emails that we receive because you know, I've de I definitely had someone reach out and say, well, I wrote this email and I didn't get a response from you um, specifically, but because we do make um, decisions as a body, we um, share um, those emails. We do talk to um, leadership so we can have a, respo a response that takes into consideration. Do we actually know? Is this something for us to explore? Is there something that, you know, maybe already working on with staff that the governing board members are not aware of? And when I said the first thing, do we know? I mean, as an entire organization. Because there's things that definitely because education is um, the current profession of um, all of our leadership, they're working on things behind the scenes, um, you know, eight, 10 hours a day. And we as governing board members see a lot of the output. So as a result, we want um, the community to know that we receive, we appreciate. And I think um, Dr. Forless's um, leadership that makes sure and ensures that we receive all the correspondence that's coming in. But um, neither do we as board members want to receive um, a letter and respond um, to the person and say, yeah, I understand. I was thinking the same way without actually having a consensus of our other board members about the response to that. So hence, do know that we all hear understand and appreciate the letters that you write in. So continue uh, to share your feedback and your concern. We are receiving them and taking all of that under advisement. So I just wanted to say that for as like an individual type of perspective for each and every one of us, whether, you know, myself, um, Mr. Peterson, Ms. Hutchinson, Ms. Richardson, um, President Minor, President Minor sometimes, uh, depending on what the response is, may respond with after having the discussion with um, us in different ways through the superintendent, because we, again, actually can never come together as a board and discuss anything that we've received until it's an open meeting. So neither during the week, if we respond, if we receive something, we can't get together and say, what do you think about it? This is our only time that we all get together to receive information and share it, unless it's um, an executive session. But so just kind of, because I know some people are new to the process as they um, look for a response and feedback from us. I just want to make that kind of uh, understanding and level set the expectation regarding um, board members responding to the feedback that we're receiving. Mrs. Sears, this is Pete Lesser. I, I will just simply echo your remarks that every email that board members receive or I receive or Dr. Forless receives uh, or the areas receive based on the work that we're doing are always forwarded to both Dr. Forless and myself and then passed on to the appropriate uh, groups of people that maybe they're referencing. Um, some of them at this point are similar in nature. So it's, uh, there's a, a level of consistency in the feedback that we're working on in the plan for opening up school. There are times that we do uh, email an individual back because they have a unique question about something uh, or, or maybe the circumstances is a little bit different than the general uh, feedback that we're receiving. But uh, Everybody should be assured that they're forwarded to the leadership team. They are all reviewed. They're all read. 
And then we, we get that information to the right groups who are making decisions to move our, our opening schools plan forward. Great, great comments. And Dr. Forlis, do you have anything now to add? We are five minutes before we are to adjourn, which I think we're doing very well on time. Is there anything else we need to add before we adjourn? Um, I, I don't think that there's anything else that we need to add. I just wanna um, echo all of the appreciation for those who have joined these focus groups. We've had RSVPs of over 6,000 uh, participants. And so the data that you will see in the general session will be um, a glimpse of what we are learning from these focus groups. So um, looking forward to hearing more about that. And so those of you that are out there watching the, the work session, if you want to know more, hang in there with us for the general session. The general meeting will give you even more. But thank you. Thank you, Dr. Forrest. Any other comments from board members before we adjourn? We have four minutes. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. I don't hear anyone speaking up. Um, we will make, a, I will take a motion for adjournment and then we will reconvene for the regular session at 630. So you can come back here at 630 and find us here. For all of you who want to have further great enlightenment tonight, come back and join us at 630. With that, Ms. do I have, Mrs. oh yes. Mrs. Miner, before you take the motion, I just want to confirm with Mrs. Hollins, are we all red Xing out of this meeting and a new meeting will begin at 630? I just want to confirm that process. Um, thanks for asking, Dr. Lesser. Continues throughout the evening. What we ask that you do is you um, mute your microphone, turn off your camera um, if you're going to take a break, and then just reach her in time for the start of the meeting. But the live stream continues with some um, background video. Uh, while we're on recess. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Do I hear, have a motion for adjournment? So moved. I move. Okay. Then we need a second. Second. Okay. We had the motion from Mr. Peterson and a second from Mrs. Hutchinson. Now we'll have the vote. Mrs. Sears? Aye. Richardson? Aye. Mrs. Hutchinson? Aye. Mr. Peterson? Aye. And Mrs. Minor, aye. That is unanimous for adjournment, and we will reconvene here at 6.30 for regular session. Thank you, everyone.